Australians love the idea of fast trains. It seems that every 10 years or so, politicians come up with a grand new plan to have us zipping between cities. Fast rail is once again back on the agenda, with both major parties spruiking their own particular plans and vision. And with the economic crisis brought on by COVID-19, now seems like the right time for the stimulus that these kinds of large infrastructure projects would bring. But do the plans actually stack up? Hello and welcome to the Grattan Podcast. I'm Kat Clay, the Head of Digital Communications. Today I'm joined by two members of Grattan's Transport and Cities team, Senior Associate Greg Moran and Associate Tom Crowley, to discuss their new report, Fast Train Fever, why, why renovated rail might work, but bullet trains won't. So first up, Tom, the title of your report suggests that there might be two different types of trains, renovated rail and bullet trains. Can you take us through both of these? Sure can, yeah. So so there are in fact, Kat, many, many types of trains and this can be a bit of a confusing discussion. Sometimes people talk about fast trains and very fast trains and faster trains and there's not necessarily a a precise kind of technical difference between those things. Um, So as you mentioned, we've kind of delineated between two categories that we're particularly interested in talking about. And the first of those is your bullet trains and this is the thing that most of us think of first. Uh, It's what they've got in Japan, it's what they've got in France and in China. It's a train on a new track built to modern standards and it can get up above 250 and and even up to 350 kilometres an hour, so quite fast. Um, And then in the next category, you've got your rail renovations. Uh, And as the name suggests, that's, you know, really rather than building a new line, it's improving on a rail line that already exists. Um, So you might be straightening it out, you might be electrifying it. uh, And just by doing that, you can actually sometimes get the speeds up above 200 kilometres. So it's not quite as fast as a bullet train, um, but it is still considerably fast than most of the trains that we have uh, in Australia today. So it's kind of fast enough to care, if you like. Um, So it's a category that that we'll be considering uh, in this report. Now, Greg, the new report takes a look at the major fast train plans uh, that are on the table at the moment from both sides of government. Could you tell us a little bit more about these plans and who is proposing what? Yeah, sure, Kat. So, as you say, both sides of government kind of have their uh, vision for fast train investment in Australia. And I guess firstly looking at federal labour, uh, their plan is probably the one that most people know about. So, their, their, uh, their plan is for a bullet train between uh, Melbourne and Brisbane. So as Tom was just saying, this would be a train that kind of goes up to 350 kilometres an hour, would be stopping at Canberra and Sydney, a lot of other major cities along the way. Um, This particular plan actually has a bit of a history. It dates back to when Labor were last in government uh, between uh, 2010 and 2013. Uh, And even during that period, they commissioned quite a a detailed feasibility study into the plan. Um, And so I guess a couple of other facts and figures about it. Um, It would take about 50 years to build from go to woe, um, although different segments of the line would come into operation in in different stages. Uh, And based on that uh, feasibility study from back in 2013, the uh, cost of it in today's dollars would be about $130 billion. So this is a mega, mega project. Um, The Commonwealth Government has their own vision and it is called the faster rail plan and this falls into the rail renovations category that Tom was talking about and this is for plans to upgrade existing lines between Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, um, lines to the regional cities and towns um, that connect to those capitals and so they're targeting um, faster speeds of potentially up to an average of 160 kilometres an hour which in some cases is quite higher than what we have uh, today. And the Commonwealth's kind of headline objectives for this plan are to uh, boost major regional centres and take pressure off our capital cities. Um, And a number of these plans that the Commonwealth is talking about kind of overlap with a lot of um, uh, state government plans as well. So, Tom, after living in France and South Korea myself, I love the idea of a bullet train. Who wouldn't want the option of avoiding airports and being able to get from the heart of Melbourne to the heart of Sydney in just a few hours? Um, Shouldn't we catch up with the rest of the world and just build it? 
it, it, look, it, it does sound great, doesn't it? Uh, I'll admit it sounds it sounds like an appealing idea to me as well, and I understand why people might feel left out, especially, you know, this this mentality of well, everybody else has one, so so should we. Um, but the first thing that I think it is worth saying there is that the story around the world is actually quite a bit more complicated than that. So first, like a lot of the countries that we would normally compare ourselves to actually don't have bullet trains. So Canada doesn't have them. Uh, the US doesn't have one. Um, the UK uh, has one at the moment and they're building another line that frankly looks like a bit of a disaster. So we're not the only ones who've had a bit of a rocky experience with fast rail and we shouldn't sort of think that, you know, we're the last in the world to catch up by any stretch. So that's one point. But the second point is that, so the main places that, that do have your big bullet train networks, Europe, Japan, and China, essentially. And, and the second point is they just don't look like us. Um, it's a pretty simple point, really. We have a small, sparse population and they don't. Um, China is vast, of course. It has 1.4 billion people. Tokyo is the biggest city in the world. Um, Europe, of course, has many cities clustered close together. Uh, and Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane are just worlds apart by comparison. So we're talking about, you know, nearly 2,000 kilometres of track that we would be building here for about 15 million people. And that would be completely unprecedented. Uh, even if you double our population in a few decades' time, that would still be completely unprecedented. So we're sort of so far away from the population and the geographical patterns that the successful uh, fast rail stories have around the world. And, and that really matters because another thing that we know from around the world is that you do need a lot of passengers for a bullet train to even cover its operating costs. Um, they're obviously very expensive to build, especially if they're long like ours is. Uh, and so, you know, if you build a bullet train that, that doesn't have enough passengers, it's very, very expensive indeed. And I think it's quite likely that Australia could be in that category. So we really shouldn't have fast train FOMO, as I'm going to call it. But turning to you, Greg, don't we need bullet trains to reduce our emissions and meet our emissions reduction targets? I mean, all those flights between Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane create a lot of emissions. Doesn't a bullet train help the environment because people would be getting on the train instead of flying? Yeah, Kat, so there's there's no doubt that travelling by bullet train would be a lot less emissions in, intensive um, than flying, uh, but the problem lies in construction. So um, constructing this bullet train line would take, as I said before, almost 50 years and would be incredibly emissions intensive in itself, um, particularly when you take into account all of the emissions that are created when you produce all the concrete, like the vast quantities of concrete and steel that the train line needs. So because of all those construction emissions and because we have to wait so long uh, for the line to get up and running and to actually start taking planes out of the air, because of those two factors, it, it means that the building this, this bullet train line may actually lead to emissions being uh, higher than they would have otherwise have been for quite a long time. So we've done some estimates where we've worked out that it could be for a period of 20 years or more that our decision to build the bullet train will have raised emissions. Now, further into the future, of course, it will start to, um, the effects will start to kick in and we'll start to get a net uh, reduction in emissions from the project. Um, but it could be about 40 years um, from, the, from the, the day that we decide to build it till the time that it actually creates a net reduction in emissions. We've estimated that it could be at least 40 years before you actually get that effect. So as obviously, as we sit here today in 2020, you look at that timeline and that's unlikely to do much to meet the 2050 ambition of, of reaching net zero emissions. And really that's that's kind of the big game for emissions reduction to get uh, our economy and the world on a trajectory to net zero by 2050. And by our estimates, the bullet train just can't help us get there. I, I think it's also worth just re um, remembering that um, aviation emissions are a big issue um, kind of globally, but when it comes to domestic aviation, they're actually only a pretty small part of the bigger picture. doesn't mean we don't need to address them. Um, doesn't mean it's not a tricky area for emissions reduction, um, but any sense that this bullet train is going to kind of make a massive dent in our national emissions just isn't really true. And that's a really good point you make that, um, you know, while the train itself is a really nice idea in theory, um, you know, a lot of the times we don't think about the emissions needed to create the train in the first place. 
And following on from that, I mean, you said before that Labor's plan from a bullet, for a bullet train dates back to when they were in government. Uh, what kind of work did they do to show that this was a worthwhile investment? Yeah, so they, they undertook a really detailed feasibility study um, back in 2013. And that feasibility study actually had, they, they estimated a, a benefit cost ratio um, for the project. And that ratio was uh, 2.3 to 1. Uh, and so what that means is for every dollar invested in the project, um, there would be $2.30 in, in benefits. So that looked really positive. Um, but we've looked at this again and, and we think there are probably a number of issues with the study uh, that if you were addressed and if you took them together, it would probably mean that the proposal is looking a lot less favourable now. In particular, that benefit cost ratio might not look as favourable. So I'll, I'll just step through some of the, the issues that, that we kind of looked at there. Um, one of the main ones was the discount rate that was used in this benefit cost ratio uh, calculation. Their calculation was was very sensitive to this discount rate. And so the discount rate, um, for those who don't know, it's it's essentially the tool that lets us put costs and benefits that are in the future uh, onto a comparable basis today. So it expresses how much we value uh, costs and benefits in the future relative to costs and benefits today. So what the 2013 feasibility study did is use a 4% um, uh, discount rate. And so this meant that benefits and costs in the future were discounted less heavily. Um, now, the, the issue here is that our current standard discount rate by which we're meant to assess infra infrastructure projects is 7%. And if you actually did the benefit cost ratio with the 7% discount rate, um, the the ratio would fall from 2.3 to 1 to 1.1 to 1. So quite a big fall there. Um, closely related to that um, is another issue where back in 2013, um, they assumed that there wasn't going to be another uh, Sydney airport. Um, and their assumptions were that the fact that there was going to be capacity constraints at Sydney airport meant there would be higher demand for the bullet train. Obviously, now we know that there is going to be a, a second Sydney airport. I mean, this is uh, new information that we can we can take account of. And so if we assume that there's going to be a second Sydney airport and we use a 7% discount rate, the benefit cost ratio actually falls to one to one. So that means you'd build this thing and get no net benefits or, or net costs. And so at that point, if you have sort of $1 of cost overrun, you've actually built the whole thing to, to create a cost. So they were kind of the, the headline issues that we were looking at, but there were sort of a few few others that potentially cast the proposal in, in sort of a less favourable light. Um, one is around the the alignment that the line ended up taking. So it's basically the path that the, the line took, particularly through regional areas. So initially the study was trying to come up with a, a design for this line that would service regional areas. But in the end, what they found was to build stations kind of in the middle of our existing, um, a, a number of our ex existing regional towns and cities would just be too expensive. So they've kind of had to draw the line alongside a lot of these towns. And sometimes it's kind of five, 10, even 20 kilometers out of town. So uh, this bullet train is probably not gonna service regional populations as well as maybe it was initially sold that it would. Um, we also think that the proposal uh, didn't take a full account of potential cost overruns. Um, you know, Grattan's done a lot of work previously on cost overruns and we've found that the bigger the project, the more likely the cost overruns and also the bigger the cost overruns. So for a, for a project of this magnitude, I think, you know, the, the, the perspective for large cost overruns is, is quite high. And, and just finally on this, the, the 2013 study didn't really take full account of who's actually going to pay, who's going to foot the bill for this $130 billion project. Um, and there's a sort of a technical economic question here about um, whether the benefit cost ratio should have taken into account um, the excess burden of tax. And that's just kind of economic jargon for um, the loss of welfare that taxes create in society. It doesn't mean that all taxes are bad. It just means that there's a cost that sometimes needs to be taken account of. And um, there are costs that may not have been taken account of in this, in this uh, benefit cost ratio calculation. But then there's also some sort of fairness and, and sort of fiscal questions about who should pay when um, the study itself said that business travellers would be the main benefits. Um, and also when you think that for $130 billion, you can spend that on a lot of different projects. We've, de we've identified about 20 pretty large, even mega projects on their own, um, whose headline costs add up to about $130 billion. 
Yeah, and there's a very interesting point that you make in the report, which is that, um, you know, it's primarily a benefit to Eastern Coast business travellers. So people in Tasmania and Western Australia aren't really going to see the benefit of um, an East Coast fast rail. Um, so when you look at it, I mean, unfortunately, the idea of a bullet train for Australia doesn't really stack up. Turning now to the proposed rail renovations, Tom, I'm wondering if you can take them through, uh, take us through them for us. Are they likely to be good investments? Well, I think the the first thing to say there, Kat, is that we just don't know at this stage. Um, so unlike the bullet train, you know, as Greg mentioned with the bullet train, we've got thousands of pages of this very detailed feasibility study that we're able to, to pour over and comment on. We don't have that for, for any of these rail renovation proposals. Um, you know, there, there's no business case. So the business cases are, are underway or have been committed to by governments, but they don't exist yet. Um, so there's a lot of detail that we don't have. Um, but we can say that they are less ambitious. Uh, we can say that they are less expensive. Uh, and certainly some of them could be worthwhile. You know, if you're proposing to, you know, basically up, uh, sorry, upgrade rather a, a train line that plenty of people are going to use, um, that, of course, could be worth doing uh, for its own sake. Um, but having said that, and, and one of the things that we talk about in, in this report, uh, a lot of the claims about what the renovations might be able to do are pretty much unbelievable. Um, so the big claim that we don't buy is that they are somehow going to decentralise our population. Um, and decentralisation has been, I suppose, a bit of a buzzword in Australian politics for decades. It's this sort of idea that if you can move people out of the big cities and into the regions, uh, you kill bird, two birds with one stone because you make the cities more livable and you give the regions a boost at the same time. And that's the logic that the federal government is, is using quite explicitly with its renovation plan. Um, in fact, it sees it as part of its broader population strategy and, and they argue that you, know, you, you move people out of the big city, they keep their city job, but they live in the region and they can grow the region and everybody wins. Um, and it sounds great. It sounds like an appealing idea once again, um, but we just don't believe that it's going to work. So even if you make it quicker to commute, say, from Sydney to Wollongong, will that mean more people will move out of the city um, but keep their city job? Uh, it might, uh, but I think that the key qualification is probably not enough people to matter. Um, so this, the, the simple fact is that it's, it's just really hard um, in the first instance to get people to move and it's especially hard if you want them to be making uh, long commutes. And so even though, you know, we are talking about faster trains, in a lot of cases we are still talking about very long commutes. Um, so, you know, for a lot of the candidates that are on the list, you're still looking at an hour plus and that is just not going to work for most people. We, we know that people won't tolerate commutes for that long if they can avoid it. Um, now, some renovations do go shorter than that. So for Geelong to Melbourne uh, and Gold Coast to Brisbane, for example, you're talking about half an hour and that is pretty quick. Um, but another thing that we found is that when people do commute from the regions at the moment, uh, pretty much unless they're working in the CBD, they drive. Uh, and overwhelmingly, in fact, that's true. If you're from out of town, you just don't catch public transport into the city unless you're going central for work purposes. Um, so really, you know, in that context, the only group that you're sort of most likely to coax out of uh, out into the regions is CBD workers, and they represent only about 15% of the city's total. So that's a much smaller pool already that you're dealing with. Um, but even if you suppose that was wildly successful and you were able to double the number of commuters from Geelong to Melbourne, you know, that, that'd be pretty huge. Um, is that going to make a big difference to traffic in Melbourne? No way. Um, so, you know, a, a doubling is, is still a, basically, a, I guess, a drop in the ocean compared to the enormous tide of population growth in Melbourne. Um, so if you doubled the Geelong to Melbourne uh, CBD commuter population, uh, that would be about 3% of the new people that Melbourne adds every single year. So it, it's just nothing in the grand scheme of things. It, it, it's kind of a blip and the same is true in, in Sydney and in Brisbane. Um, so I guess in summary, are you going to move a lot of people out of the city? Probably not. Uh, will you ease pressure on the city even if you do that? Certainly not. So, Greg, just digging into that a little bit, I'd like to hear your perspective on this. 
you know, there is a lot of talk that rail renovations will benefit regional areas. Um, what's your take on this? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, if we, if we make it quicker to get into Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane from surrounding, you know, regional centres and towns, there's no doubt there's going to be a benefit to, to the populations of those towns in the sense that, you know, every now and then um, people in those places, you know, need to come into the capital, whether it's for, for work or just an important appointment or, you know, maybe it's just come to, to a concert or the footy, you know, which is something they have to come into the capital for. Um, but I think when we're talking about boosting regions, what we're really talking about is um, providing a, a significant and additional um, economic boost to the region. So it's not just a, about you know, creating a few more jobs or, or anything like that. It's more about um, that's creating jobs that wouldn't have just been created elsewhere. We're actually taking advantage of something that this region can offer. Um, and are we creating more diverse jobs and potentially higher paying jobs? Because those are things that the people really value. So um, we, we've looked at the, the research that's out there on on the effects of, of faster train links and regions. Um, and, you know, we think that the, the evidence that regions will get a significant uh, boost is, is pretty mixed at best and therefore not particularly strong. Uh, and, and so I'll, I'll talk about um, an example of that, that research in, in a moment, but um, I think some important context to kind of keep in mind here is that we've had about 100 years of ongoing urbanisation. And what I mean by that is 100 years of people um, continually and increasingly choosing uh, to live and work in cities and businesses to, to locate in cities. So I think we need to keep in mind that there's a strong tide there that we're swimming against any time we think we can kind of move activity and, and people back out of our biggest cities. So just coming back to the idea of, of rail renovations and, and faster train links, there's actually some reasons to think that these faster train links might um, reinforce the kind of urbanisation trend rather than rather than reverse it. And so what might happen is that, you know, if you think about businesses that are located in cities at the moment, they often have a competitive advantage over similar businesses in the regions because the ones in the cities, they have a larger labour pool to choose from. Uh, they have a potentially larger customer uh, pool to serve. And so if we make it easier for these business businesses in the city uh, to access labour and potential customers in the region, then that may actually um, just further their advantage. And, and this isn't just a sort of a theoretical idea. This is actually um, being seen to have played out overseas. So there's been research done in France following the introduction of their uh, TGV fast train network. And what was found there is, so this network, it connected Paris to smaller cities and then smaller cities to, to regions around them. And, and what was found is that Paris seemed to have benefited the most from this and smaller cities also benefited, but they benefited less than the big city in Paris. And they also seem to have benefited from the smaller places around them. So there is some actual uh, empirical evidence for this idea that maybe just improving connectivity improves, improves the advantage already held by big places. Yes, and I um, did appreciate about this report, thinking about all the trains I've actually caught, including that Paris to Lyon train. Um, and tapping into that, I mean, could regional destinations get a boost to their tourism by upgrading rail connections? Yeah, so tourism obviously seems like a, a you know, a, a, surely it, it's a win-win um, uh, prospect, but even the, the benefits to tourism have their caveats, unfortunately. So the first thing we need to ask is, you know, are the extra tourism dollars now flowing to a place because we've made it easier to get there? Are they additional? And, and that's kind of jargon to mean, um, are they tourist dollars that wouldn't have just been spent somewhere else? Because unless they're tourist dollars that would have, um, wouldn't have just been spent somewhere else, we haven't really created anything. We've just shifted things around. Um, <clears throat> secondly, I think we need to think really carefully about um, have we made this destination sufficiently closer in time to make it, you know, significantly more attractive to visit than today? Because, you know, we can look at a place that might be two hours away. If our rail renovation makes it an hour 20, yes, of course, that's make, made it a little easier to get to, a little quicker to get to. But how big of a difference do we think 
that's going to make. So there's a kind of a magnitude question here. And then there's a really interesting finding, again, from, from overseas. I think this one's from Spain, where they saw that <clears throat> Spanish cities that were um, got better connections after their fast train network was, um, was built. They had an increase in, in day trips, which was good because obviously people could get there and back to, to bigger cities more quickly, but they actually saw a drop in overnight stays. So how that kind of works out for the sort of a local area's um, you know, tourism economy is, I, I guess, to be seen. But again, it's just interesting, even what seems like an obvious win has its caveats. I just want to turn to you, Tom. Because the report's conclusions essentially are that rail renovations aren't likely to meet some of their really ambitious objectives, but they still might be worthwhile. How should governments decide which are the right projects to build? Well, firstly, I think you've got to decide what problem you're trying to solve. Uh, And then you've got to ask yourself, is this the best way to solve that problem? Um, And so, you know, if the problem that you're trying to solve is about easing pressure on the cities or developing regions, the arguments that we're making suggest that this is probably not the best way to to solve that problem. Um, And there are other places you could look at. So, for example, if you wanted to ease pressure on cities, um, we've argued at Grattan before that a congestion tax, um, you know, would be a a really effective way to do that. And the relaxing zoning restrictions would would be another worthwhile thing to look at. Um, but also, you know, if you're a rail enthusiast uh, and you want to focus on public transport in cities, there are areas of need uh, that we've identified in this report that you might want to focus on first. And so one of the things that we found was, you know, we, we kind of spend all this time talking about regional commuters, but there are outer suburbs in Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane where it takes well over an hour to get into the city by public transport. So Frankston, um, Penrith, places where heaps of people live are very, very poorly connected in, in some cases. Um, and you can have projects that improve metropolitan rail times that also have flow on benefits uh, for the region. So the Melbourne Metro Tunnel project, which is underway at the moment, you know, it speeds up the Frankston line, it speeds up the Geelong line as well, because it's about making the whole system flow better. So if you're interested in, you know, taking pressure off a public transport network, you might have more luck considering projects that have that flavour and that focus on areas of need within cities as well as outside them. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to regions, um, there are others who've recommended some some areas that, you know, are pressing priorities for the regions, things like mobile and internet connectivity and freight links. Um, so the infrastructure bodies at, at a state level uh, in Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland have quite a lot to say about um what regions need. And so, you know, again, really, I guess, focusing on the objective is really important rather than focusing on doing something that's big, you know, just because we like building big things. Um, You know, it's important to remember that I guess that that small can be beautiful and you can get a lot done with these small targeted projects. Um, But I suppose the final note to end on, uh, you know, uh, is that there is a a pretty well-established way to decide whether to invest in any project, whatever it is, Uh, And that is, you know, do a business case, do a proper independent cost benefit analysis and you proceed if if it stacks up. Um, So as I said before, you know, for these rail renovations, those business cases are coming uh, and it's only kind of once that's done that governments will really be in a position to assess whether any of these proposals have merit. Um, And I guess that is an important note to finish on because, you know, we might be kind of eager for stimulus in, in a COVID World, post-COVID world, and, and there may be some good reasons for that. Um, but it doesn't mean that you get to kind of throw the rule book out the window. You've still got to make sure, uh, as always, that anything that you're spending public money on will clearly benefit the public more than it will cost, and that's the proper role for, for cost-benefit analysis. Uh, we think that a bullet train clearly won't do that. Uh, renovations might, um, but as, as I said, if governments are really interested in kind of taking pressure off cities and uh, boosting the regions, they should look elsewhere. Thank you so much, Greg and Tom. I love that idea that small infrastructure projects can be beautiful. Um, And a bullet train probably isn't such a great idea for Australia. If you'd like to read the report that we've been discussing today, it's available for free on our website at grattan.edu.au. Before you go, Grattan Institute is a not-for-profit organisation and we rely on donations from people like you We provide our independent research, events and podcasts free of charge to the public. 
If you found benefit in our work this year, can I urge you to please donate at grattan.edu.au donate. As always, if you've enjoyed our podcast, hit subscribe on your favourite podcast app or on our YouTube channel. We've started posting them there as well. You can also join the conversation on Twitter at Grattan Inst and Facebook Grattan Institute. To all our listeners, take care and thanks for listening.